My game of the day from round three of the Grenka Chess Classic in Baden-Baden is Arkady Nidic with the white pieces against the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, this was a really long game, a total roller coaster ride, so without further ado, let's crack on. Carlsen does not play a classical opening, he plays the modern defense, allowing white to seize the center and plays a6. Now, this has been seen before. In fact, it's a fairly standard idea. Black is trying to advance with b5 and then play bishop b7 to attack white's center. But Nidic, after a couple of minutes thought, clamps that down with a4. Good move. Knight f6. So wants to play knight g4 sometimes, so that's stopped by h3. White still has the center. You know, in the in the good old days when the, the modern was first played, um, white center often collapsed horribly. You know, a lot of white players didn't know how to handle it. Nowadays, the top guys uh, are very careful and they know what to do. And they understand that they can get away with moves like g4 as Nidic played. g4. Uh, looks crazy to advance pawn at the side, but the thing is, when you control the center, actually you can get away with moves like this. And in fact, it can be very nice to gain space on the king's side. Well, black has to strike back in the center. c5 is a reasonable move here. Carlsen chose e5. And Nidic closed the position. So the game has the character of a kind of king's Indian, except... White's pawn is on c2 rather than c4. Um, but still, you know, we have this locked centre. And white has gained very useful space with g4. And Nidic continued with knight e2. So this is a standard idea. Basically, our pawns were exchanged. If knight d7, then the knight will come to g3. So that means you now cover the h5 square, so you're ready to play g5 and knight e4. And strategically, white actually has a really pleasant position. Um, and therefore, perhaps, after just a few minutes' thought, Carlsen played the outrageous peace sacrifice, bishop takes g4. Of course, this was taken. Uh, what does black have for his piece? Well, he's got two pawns. The knight is hassling the bishop. And you've got some nice pawns on the king side. But, objectively, it should be good for white. But it's tricky. So yesterday we saw Carlson playing a very technical game. Today he's really going for it. But maybe because he's doing this because he strategically he didn't like his position. So he'd prefer not to suffer in silence. Well, Nidic now thought for 22 and a half minutes. Uh, he was analysing very long variations. Uh, after the game, he said, what about bishop d2? He was looking at this very long line with queen b6, threatening the pawn here, and knight e4. And, well, it, it, it's incredibly complex. I mean, I think... But in the end, I mean, he thought that was okay for White. In the end, he chose simplicity. And in a complex situation, that's not a bad rule of thumb. Keep it simple. So queen d2, perhaps preparing to castle queenside, perhaps looking to use his bishop on this diagonal. Okay, black develops, knight d7. Now, here's an interesting moment. White could play something like bishop h3, and then... Black would take, and then f5. And suddenly it's not exactly clear what white is doing. You know, white's minor pieces are locked out. This is a much easier position for black to play than white. I'm sure white is okay here, but, yeah, practically speaking, maybe it's not so simple for white. You know, if the king castles on the queen side, then suddenly b5 and the lines are opening. So Nidic had another quite a big think here, thought for over 16 minutes and came up with knight e4, very provocative move. Obviously that this gets kicked with f5. Now if knight takes d6 then I think queen c7 picks up the knight, traps the knight. So bishop g5, that was in, that was all intentional. So 
that means that when, when the knight moves, well, white isn't going to be hassled. The bishop isn't going to be hassled with f4. So queen b6. Now, careful if that knight moves, then queen takes f2 check. But Nidich has worked all this out. Bishop h3. Incredibly complex. You know, one false move here, and it all goes to pot. Um, if pawn takes knight, then although at first glance this looks very risky, in fact, white simply has a huge advantage here. These bishops are fantastically powerful. This bishop coming into e6, and the king isn't really in any danger there. So therefore the knight, well, came to f6, and this was exchanged off. So the position, and now knight c3, the position is stabilised, for white at least. And it could be that white can simply castle on the queen side and bring this rook over to g1 and set up some kind of kingside attack. Or perhaps just castle kingside. I mean, white does have options according to how black plays here. So Carlson decided to force the issue and he took the pawn on b2. So now he has three pawns for the piece. Now maybe rook b3 is the best move here, but instead... Rook takes b7 is played, and here maybe Carson missed a good idea. Rook b8 is probably best. And, uh, you know, white has to be careful here with, with the rook coming to c8, and black probably has enough to, to hold the position, but it, it's still complicated. You can see for the moment this bishop is the problem, locked out of play by this pawn. But instead, Carson played rook f7. And now Nidich starts to take control again. Now, of course, he wants to exchange queens, and he's very confident in in end games, as we saw yesterday in his game against Anand, where he say miraculously saved this worst rook and pawn end game. So he's chasing Carlson's queen. Carlson opening up the diagonal for the bishop. Nidich played queen c6. What he's trying to do there, well. The only way for black to get rid of this queen is to take the rook away from this a pawn. And Nidich was hoping that that would offer him good chances. So this is really what Nidich is looking for. Nidich is an excellent technical player and he's glad to get to an end game where he's managed to connect his rooks. This bishop is about to come back into play via f1 on this useful diagonal, and the rest of his pieces are also good. If black tries to activate with rook c7, then white captures on f6, and knight d5 is obviously a winning knight fork. So this is tricky with this, with the rooks about to penetrate on the b-file, looks nasty for black. Carlson played h6, and now they're starting to run short of time. But Carlson in trouble now. And Nidich had prepared this move. Knight e4, excellent counter sacrifice. If the pawn takes the knight, then bishop e6 picks up the exchange. And, well, you might think Carlson sort of gained back some material, but after this, this is really bad. These, these pawns are going to drop. And I think black's situation is hopeless. So bishop e5, but with that pawn knocked out of the way, then clearly Nidich has gained something here. Now they're entering time pressure and, and all hell breaks loose. Now this is an important position. Nidich said after, he spent a long time here. I mean, you know, five minutes and he had very little time left. He said he thought that knight takes e5 was completely winning. Um, but he just wasn't quite sure. Um, and you know, he didn't like to simplify too early. He said afterwards, maybe rook b4, followed by bringing the bishop back. And black's king is very poorly placed. Could be. Um, rook b6 is also a very tempting move. Certainly this would simplify the task. Instead he played bishop g2. And suddenly, after bishop f6, things aren't so clear. Um... This knight is stymied for the moment. He, knight is played knight h2, threatening bishop d5, but somehow Carlson manages to coordinate here. Um, if rook b7, then that a pawn drops, and well, black is certainly fine there. 
So Nidich kept hold of that A-pawn. Good move. But Carlsen is now very active and hassling that bishop. A5. Keeping hold of that pawn. And now the rook is hassling the bishop, looking at this pawn as well. So Nidich has to exchange. And this is all played in a flurry of time pressure. Carlsen has three pawns for the piece. But... This pawn on d6, an isolated pawn, can't really achieve much. Last move, the time control. Afterwards, Nidich criticised Carlsen's move. He thought that h4 was a mistake. He thought that, you know, perhaps just a check and keep hassling that knight. Maybe that would have been a better chance. Instead, Carlsen played h4. Of course, it's tricky once these pawns start advancing. But... Nidich, you know, he has uh, great faith in himself, great faith in his abilities, and he looks at positions quite objectively. Now he wants to play rook d4. You know, a lot of other players would be scared about these kingside pawns, but Nidich just thought he was better and thought he should just play on here and still was playing for the win. Now that can rebound, but let's have a look what happened. Rook d3, excellent move. If instead rook d4, then h2 would have actually been a winning move. Knight can't take the pawn because of rook takes rook. Rook d3, very good move. And now that pawn is actually quite a liability. Rook had to defend the pawn. And now some shuffling from Nidich, but very good moves. Um, this move, rook f3, excellent idea. So that now his king is able to come into the corner rock solid and he's managed to redeploy his knight through this manoeuvre and suddenly this knight has broken free and is going to counter-attack taking this pawn. Now this is, you know, a lot of other players wouldn't have the confidence to play like this because it looks as though white is leaving his king so exposed. And with these pawns, black pawns, marching down the board. But Nidich, such a confident player. Um, and he's not worried about these pawns. You know, he's calculated that this knight can come back. And in fact, it's this A-pawn which is the real danger in the position. Now, Carlsen has to try and bring his rook round to try and hassle White's king. But again, Nidich has calculated it very well. Um, and probably white is just winning this position. Carlsen tries counter-attacking, and of course Nidich has put his rook in the best position behind the passed pawn, so that that pawn is now just an express zooming down the board, and, well, Nidich had calculated this perfectly, even though this is after six hours of play, I mean, by this stage, it's a, a test of stamina. A7, the pawn is going through. One last variation. If rook h2 check, of course, the rook can check the king. And now here's a tricky move. Rook b2. And if a8, then g2. And suddenly, it's black that's winning. But watch. Bishop c6. And after g2, this gets taken. And king g1. And a8 on the next turn. F3 would be good if it weren't for rook takes pawn. Check. Very important. Carlsen played rook d2, but after rook a1, guarding the back rank, it was all over. There's nothing to stop a8 queen. Well, you can play rook back, but well, you can play bishop c6, you can, you can queen. It, it really is all over, and the rook and bishop easily stop the four pawns. What a fantastic display from Nidich. He proved again what a what a brilliant technical player he is. And that's the second game, second game in a row that he's beaten Carlsen. He's, in his last two games, he beat Carlsen also in the Tromsø Olympiad. Also another great technical performance. So, well, after three rounds, uh, Nidich and Caruana lead the tournament with two out of three. Caruana beat Aronian today. Aronian played a very poor game. 
Adams defeated Baramidza, crushed Baramidza actually, and Bakho and Anand drew their game. So what a day. Yesterday, Carlson was a god. Uh, today, he flew too close to the sun. Tomorrow, Thursday, is a rest day in Baden-Baden. They play round four on Friday.